world. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That's fun. It's an exciting point in your career. I'm, yeah. I'm happy to hear it and hope you decide to stay in flag or, you know, yeah, I think I will. Yeah. Yeah. Great. It's so much fun to, uh, I was at the women in steam, a uh, mm -hmm. little kind of mixture last night. And it was great mm -hmm. to see, it was mainly young women there. And mm -hmm. it was wonderful to see so many people choosing a career. And it was interesting. We were talking about, you know, the, the good and the bad. And it, it really was wonderful to see a vibrant steam community here mm -hmm. among the women in, in Flagstaff. Yeah, Ooh. that's great. And I see it is five o'clock, so I will start here. I want to thank everyone for attending Investigation of Ambistoma Tigrinum Virus, that's ATV, in Threatened Chiricahua Leopard Frog Populations. Um, my name is Sherry Schaefer, and I'm a Flagstaff Festival of Science board member. Joining me are festival coordinator Elizabeth Bogler and this evening's presenter, Catherine Cooney. Uh, and before we start, I do have some housekeeping. So first, you need to know that the festival is live streaming this webinar to YouTube. Only the hosts and panelists will be visible or heard during the simulcast. So if you miss anything or you want to see any of the other live stream programming, including a lot of last year's, just go to YouTube. This event is part of the Flagstaff Festival of Science, often called the 10 best days of the year. Our mission is to connect and inspire the citizens of Northern Arizona, particularly youth, with the wonders of science and the joy of scientific discovery. Your participation and support are vital to our shared success. All festival events are free, thanks to our generous sponsors and donors. So if you'd like to support our work, one way you can do that is go to scifest.org and click donate. You can also find a full list of events at SciFest.org, and you can register for any of the events that re require it on our Eventbrite page. And we'll be putting that in the chat box uh, during the, during the uh, presentation. Another way you can support the festival is to take a short five minute survey after the completion of this webinar and any other events that you participate in. The survey can be found in the chat. We'll put that in there too. Also, one survey respondent will win a pair of Apple AirPods after the completion of the festival. So the more things you participate in and then take this, this survey, the more times you are entered to win. During the presentation, please type your questions in the Q&A box. If you see a question you like, you can upvote it. And due to possible time constraints, we may need to prioritize. So go ahead and do those upvotes. If you have any technical problems with the webinar, please communicate with us in the chat, not the Q&A box. Thank you very much for patiently waiting through the housekeeping portion. Um, I'm excited to get going. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Catherine Cooney. Kat is a graduate student at Northern Arizona University, where she's investigating ronavirus dynamics in threatened Chiricahua leopard frogs. Over the past nine years, Kat has maintained and studied natural systems across the United States and Central America with a focus on amphibian monitoring. In the future, Kat hopes to continue protecting and studying diverse ecosystems while connecting scientists, science to community. Her talk today will spotlight her graduate research. So take it away, Kat. Great, thanks, Sherry. I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Looks like that's working. Um, so I'd like to first say a quick thank you to everybody that has joined um, my presentation today. Um, I see my mom and my dad in the chat or in the participants. So hi, mom, hi, dad. <laughs> Um, the topic of my converse, or of my presentation today, as Sherry said, is amphibian conservation. And specifically, how I'm kind of acting as a ronavirus disease detective during my graduate research. And again, my name is Catherine Cooney. And I am a graduate student at NAU here in Flagstaff, where I am working with uh, Dr. Jeff Foster and Dr. Joe Mahaljevec. And I, my research is funded by the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the Arizona Federation of Garden Clubs, 
and the Appleton Whittle Research Ranch. And I'm brought to you guys today by the Flagstaff Festival of Science. So I'm not really sure what the background of many of the people participating in this talk is. So I'll start at the beginning with what are amphibians? And so amphibians are ectotherms, which is another word for cold blooded. And this means that their internal temperature is regulated by their environment unlike mammals who can regulate their own internal temperature and we don't depend on our environment. Um, and this basically means that if it's cold outside, an amphibian's body temperature is gonna be cold. And if it's hot outside, their body temperature is gonna be hot. Whereas mammals, our body temperature is constant. Amphibians also have soft, generally moist skin without scales. When I show this picture, a lot of times people see this red guy right here and immediately think it's a lizard, especially when I've been presenting to younger um, students, but they do not have scales, so they're not lizards. Amphibians also have eggs that do not have hard shells. They're kind of like these little soft kind of boba jelly balls, and they need to be laid in a damp environment to keep them from drying out. Amphibians also go through two life stages. Um, one is an aquatic life stage that's shown down here as the tadpoles and then the larval salamanders, which are also sometimes referred to as water dogs. So when they're first hatched out of their eggs, they have this aquatic life stage. And when they're adults, typically they have a terrestrial life stage. And then just a fun fact, uh, the word amphibian comes from the Greek word amphibios, which means to live a double life. So that kind of hints at that half aquatic, half terrestrial um, life cycle. And what aren't amphibians? So I already mentioned this, but lizards are not amphibians. They kind of resemble the salamanders there with their long tails. Um, another misnomer is a horny toad, which is this guy kind of up in the left-hand corner. Horny toads are also lizards. They're not actually toads. Um, and the difference between the amphibians and uh, reptiles, which is what is on this slide right here, is that reptiles typically have dry, scaly skin. They have hard shelled eggs. And although most reptiles can swim, they do not have an aquatic life stage. Just to go into a little bit more detail about the amphibian life cycle. This is the life cycle for frogs and toads where adult frogs and toads will typically um, find their way to a small pond or a marsh or a wetland. Uh, typically an area that has slow moving water where there's um, low predation. So hopefully no fish or uh, things like that that would eat their eggs. And they breed in these water bodies and they can lay hundreds of eggs. One female can lay hundreds of eggs, um, but a very small percentage of those actually survive to that terrestrial stage. So after the eggs are laid, they will develop and then eventually hatch into these small tadpoles here. And these tadpoles, they have internal gills and then they have these long tails here. And as they develop more, they will start to develop hind legs and then front legs. And once they've developed all four of their legs, their tail will start to reabsorb into their body and they'll start to develop lungs so that they can live on land. And so right before they're ready to leave the pond, their tail is all the way absorbed into their body and they don't have those internal gills anymore. Those have been replaced with lungs so they can live on land and hopefully travel to another pond um, and continue the breeding cycle there. Salamanders, um, which I don't know if I mentioned up here, but salamanders are these kind of lizard looking amphibians with the ta long tails. 
Salamanders have a very similar um, life cycle. This image here shows only one egg, but they too also lay a lot of eggs um, for one breeding female can lay hundreds of eggs. And those eggs then hatch into little larvae. And the main difference between um, the tadpoles, those frog and toad larvae and the salamander larvae is the salamander larvae have these external gills. So those are those kind of red feathery things sticking out the side of their head there. They have external gills instead of internal gills, which is what the tadpoles have. But they too then develop um, their arms and legs. And instead of absorbing their whole tail back into their body, they just kind of um, absorb the part of the tail that makes it more like a fin. And so their tail um, becomes less fish-like as they become terrestrial adults, but they do still maintain their tail as adults. And then kind of a, an interesting fun fact for salamanders is that not all salamanders actually complete this cycle from aquatic larvae to terrestrial adult. Um, some kind of like to play Peter Pan and they stay in an aquatic stage for their entire life. And these larval salamanders tend to be very cute, um, but when they maintain that, that aquatic stage their entire life, they kind of turn into these scary giant water monsters um, and they definitely become less cute when they stay in this phase forever um, and they get very um, territorial and they will eat the other little babies they are carnivores and so this is kind of an interesting life stage that happens in salamanders sometimes In Arizona, there are only two species of salamanders that live here. The Sonoran tiger salamander um, only lives in a small part of Southern Arizona and Northern Mexico, and it is a federally endangered species. And then the other species that lives here in Arizona is the barred tiger salamander. And this is a very common species um, in Canada and in, um, the United States, it ranges from uh, Texas up to Canada, um, from north to south, and from California all the way east to the Dakotas and Oklahoma. And so here in Arizona, there's that one very rare species and one very common species. There are 16 frog species here in Arizona. Um, and there's three pictured here that are actually local to Flagstaff. Um, this first one up here is a Western chorus frog. And you can find these typically in the spring at Buffalo Park. There's a little pond over there. And then this green one in the middle, this is a Northern leopard frog. And these are actually protected here in the state. But you can find populations of them um, in cattle tanks off of uh, Lake Mary Road, kind of near Happy Jack. And then the bottom one here, this is a canyon tree frog. And these can be found if you hike in the Grand Canyon at all, especially in the springtime. When you hike to Indian Gardens, there's a creek that runs through that campground. And these canyon tree frogs are everywhere. You can hear them, you can see them, they're everywhere and they're really cute. There's three species on this list that I highlighted in red. And these are the three invasive frog species here in Arizona. And it's good to note because invasive species pose uh, potential threats to native species, especially these bullfrogs here. There are 12 toad species here in Arizona. And again, I highlighted three that are kind of local to Northern Arizona and Flagstaff. The first one here is a red spotted toad. This one in the middle is a Mexican spade foot. And the one on the bottom here is a woodhouse's toad. And the main difference between toads and frogs is that toads tend to have rougher, bumpier, drier skin. 
their bodies are a little bit more chunky. They have shorter hind legs. So when you think of frogs, you probably imagine them leaping gracefully, these long uh, hops and toads, they kind of have these shorter hind legs. So instead of having these long arcing graceful leaps, they kind of just have these shorter hops. Toads also tend to spend more time on land and only really return to water um, when they need to breed. Whereas frogs tend to kind of hang out around water their entire lives. Another little fun fact about toads is that since they're not hanging out around water, which is typically a nice safe place if they need to jump in there and hide, um, and they're not very fast, and they have these little chunky legs that doesn't allow them to jump away from things very quickly. A lot of toads have these glands behind their eyes here. Um, and these typically have poison in them. So it's a defense mechanism against predators. So we covered what amphibians are, and now we're gonna cover what conservation is and why we care about conserving amphibians. So nature conservation is focused on protecting species from extinction, maintaining and restoring their habitats, enhancing ecosystems, and protecting biological diversity. And so amphibians are good um, components, or they're good, um, They should be conserved <laughs> because out of all vertebrate animals, amphibians face the most risk of extinction. So that's compared to like mammals, fish, birds, amphibians are the most at risk. And since 1980, 122 species of amphibians have gone extinct. In addition to that, nearly a third of all amphibian species in the world are facing extinction. So amphibians are um, in need of conservation and they definitely need to uh, be researched and studied because a lot of species have already gone extinct. So we wanna protect the ones that we still have. So what are the most common conservation threats to amphibians? I already mentioned one of them and that was invasive species. And here in Arizona, um, the major invasive species of concern are those bullfrogs I mentioned and crayfish. And just to show you guys how big bullfrogs can get, this picture is from two years ago here at a pond near Flagstaff. Um, and there were hundreds of these bullfrogs at this one pond. And you can definitely tell that smaller native frogs would not be able to compete with these giant bullfrogs for food or space or resources. And in fact, these bullfrogs will probably eat any other native species that would try to live near it. And even the tadpoles, which is this picture on the right hand side, the tadpoles are also huge and um, they can eat other um, larval amphibian species. Another uh, common conservation threat to amphibians is habitat loss. And this can come from um, urban or suburban development, um, habitat alteration from uh, water withdrawals or stream diversions, destructive fires, water pollution, or off-road vehicle use. And the last most common conservation threat to amphibians is disease. Um, and this is especially true for amphibians because they have permeable skin, which is really cool because they can breathe through their skin, but it also makes them susceptible to disease. So if you imagine us humans right now, um, to protect ourselves from coronavirus, um, we wear a mask that just covers our nose and our mouth. Um, but amphibians, since they breathe through their whole body to protect themselves, they would need to cover their whole body. Um, and so it's really easy for them 
to become susceptible to diseases because even if they touch their hand to a virus particle or their tail, they can still become infected. Whereas we would need to breathe something in or ingest something typically. Um, so some major disease threats to amphibians um, are fungi and viruses. Um, many of you have probably heard of chytrid fungus, um, and this has been affecting amph amphibians worldwide, causing massive mortality events. And it harms amphibians because it grows on their skin and prevents them from breathing and regulating their body functions. And then the most common virus um, family that affects amphibians are ranaviruses. So what are ranaviruses? They are pathogens found on every continent except Antarctica. And they affect uh, ectothermic vertebrates. So that's those cold-blooded um, vertebrates, including bony fish, amphibians, and reptiles. They pose a threat to their hosts because they can cause extensive mortality and population declines. In North America, only two species of ranaviruses have been identified. Embistema tigrinum virus, which is also called ATV, which predominantly infects salamanders, and frog virus three, or FV3, which is able to infect frogs, salamanders, reptiles, and fish. The first detection of ATV was actually right here in Arizona with the investigation of some localized die-offs of that endangered Sonoran, ti Sonoran tiger salamander I mentioned earlier. These were first observed in 1985. And in Arizona, only that ATV strain of ronavirus has been detected. FV3 is typically um, on the East Coast. Um, it's also been found in California, but it has never been found in Arizona, only ATV. So that ATV ronavirus in Arizona has been affecting the salamander populations since its detection in 1985. Um, it can cause systemic infections and recurrent epidemics. The symptoms are often observed in the larval stages, which are these two pictures on the right-hand side, and they include swelling, lesions, necrosis, and internal bleeding. And you can see from these pictures that the symptoms can get pretty gnarly. Um, and typically when larval salamanders get symptoms this bad, they will not recover and they will typically die. Since its initial detection in 1985, ATV ronavirus has been found to only infect salamanders. Um, however, it may be an undocumented conservation threat affecting the recovery of the native Chiricahua leopard frog. Chiricahua leopard frogs are a native species here to Arizona and they are federally threatened. Um, they've disappeared from over 80% of their historic range and currently they can only be found in these locations on the map. So a small bit of New Mexico, um, central Arizona near the Mogollon Rim and small sections of Southern Arizona. Potentially there are uh, larger populations in Mexico but there has been little to no um, surveying done. So we really don't know the extent of where they are located in Mexico. So part of the Chiricahua leopard frog recovery plan includes a captive breeding program at the Phoenix Zoo, where wild frogs are often collected from the wild and brought into the zoo for propagation, which means breeding. They basically have an arranged marriage and they make a bunch of babies that hopefully will get reintroduced into the wild. Before these wild caught frogs are brought into the zoo and introduced to the captive breeding population, they undergo a quarantine period, um, which we are all familiar with. 
And during this period, they are swabbed and tested for diseases like that chytrid fungus I mentioned and ronaviruses. And since 2012, more than 10 Chiricahua leopard frogs brought into the Phoenix Zoo have tested positive for ronavirus. However, the specific strain was unknown because in North America, there is ATV, that salamander specific virus, and there's also FB3, which can infect frogs and has been found in California. So the results of these ronavirus swabs were sent to the San Diego Zoo and the Mahaljevic lab, which is um, my lab here um, at NAU in 2018. And these swabs were then confirmed as ATV. So they were confirmed as that salamander specific virus. And this is the first confirmation of ATV detected in natural frog populations. And this is a mystery because no wild frogs have ever been found to be infected with ATV. It's only been found in salamanders. And so it was basically um, my graduate research to try to figure out what's going on here. If the frogs are being infected with this virus or if it was just some kind of weird fluke. And so I was comparing um, the salamanders that test positive for ATV to frogs that test positive for ATV. And what we know is that salamanders are susceptible to that ATV ronavirus. And we now think that possibly Chiricahua leopard frogs are susceptible to this virus. We know that salamanders can get infected by the virus and display obvious symptoms or um, mortality events. However, we don't know if the frogs are actually getting infected by the virus or if it was just on their skin somehow. Um, and that's why the swabs are coming back positive. Again, we know that the salamanders can get the virus, get infected and be killed by the virus, sometimes um, up to 100% of uh, salamanders at a site can get the virus and can die. But we don't know if those frogs are getting killed by the virus at all because we've never seen any of those classic symptoms like the salamanders have. And we've never found any frogs dead that have tested positive for ATV ronavirus. So, I kind of had two hypotheses um, for why these frogs could be testing positive for ATV ronavirus. Um, and the first is that it is possible that ATV may have historically coexisted with the frogs, um, but asymptomatically. And no one has ever really looked before um, or tested frogs for ATV because they don't display any symptoms and they haven't been um, dying in strange ways. So it's possible that they may just be asymptomatic carriers or something like that. But it's also possible that ATV may be spilling over from salamander populations into frogs due to possibly a mutation in the virus. Um, and if this is what's happening, it's possible that although we aren't seeing external symptoms right now, there may be internal symptoms such as lower fertility or some kind of reproductive effects. If ATV is host jumping from salamanders to frogs, it wouldn't be the first time a virus is able to jump from one species to another. Three other examples are the bubonic plague, um, which jumped from fleas to humans and killed millions of Europeans during the Middle Ages. Rabies, um, which can jump from bats or other small mammals to humans or one mammal species to another mammal species. Um, and without vaccination, rabies is almost always fatal. And the last uh, most relevant example 
are influenzas. Um, the Spanish flu or the flu of 1918 uh, originated in an avian host, so birds. Um, and that 1918 flu killed 50 million people worldwide. To test for ATV ronavirus in Arizona amphibians, dip nets were used to catch frogs and salamanders of all life stages. And this is just a short video. Um, but dip nets um, were used to try to catch amphibians of all different life stages um, at many different sites across the state. So I'm using a dip net here and here. And each individual that was caught was stored in a cup of clean water to rinse any environmental particles from its skin. Will play. Great. So when two people were serving together, a seine was used, which is what we're using here. Um, and this is usually more effective and easier because you have a lot bigger volume. Once amphibians are captured and stored in their individual cups of clean water, they are swabbed. And this is how we detect if there's ronavirus on them. Um, so remember that they can breathe through their skin. And so swabbing their skin um, should be an adequate way to pick up the virus. And so we just make sure we get all over the body, hands, feet. And then once the swabs are collected, the individual amphibians are released. And sometimes I caught or saw other things in the field other than amphibians, including snakes, turtles, lizards, bear tracks, and one time a lost dog that I found in the middle of Coronado National Forest miles away from civilization. Um, and she was safely returned to her owners after two days together. So in the summers of 2018, 2019, and 2020, over 100 sites were visited and um, almost 2,000 swabs were collected from amphibians. We were interested um, in sites that had Turkau leopard frogs, sites that had those barred tiger salamanders, and sites that had both species. Um, because if our hypothesis of host jumping is correct, we would have expected to maybe find more positive results in Chiricahua leopard frogs at sites that um, were either near salamanders or also had salamanders coexisting. And so this map right here just shows all the sites that we went to. Blue dots are sites that only had those tiger salamanders. Yellow sites are sites that only had Chiricahua leopard frogs. And Red dots are sites that had both species, and then black dots are sites that had neither species. You can kind of see that there's a small clump um, near the Mogollon Rim that has both salamanders and frogs, and some sites kind of near or kind of north of Tucson that have salamanders and frogs too. And so keep those two areas in mind. 
because then we looked at where frogs were testing positive for ATV ronavirus. And in 2019, we detected three sites um, in Tonto National Forest that had positive results for Chiricahua leopard frogs testing positive for ATV. And this clump of sites was an area that also had salamanders nearby. However, um, not all three of those sites had salamanders coexisting. And it was interesting because um, one site was a small stock pond site and the two other sites were a crystal clear creek. And so their sites were differing a lot in how they looked. And then in 2020, we found six positive sites where Chiricahua leopard frogs were testing positive for ATV ronavirus. And in 2020, we had um, less unique sites that we visited, but we were conducting revisits of sites of interest, especially in that Tonto National Forest area where we detected ATV in 2019. We still found that sites were testing positive where no salamanders were present, which is interesting. And it was also interesting because the sites were still differing greatly in their habitat structure. Um, this is an example of a site that tested positive down near the Galeros. Um, and it was a really muddy, small stock pond site um, that had little to no vegetation. And then up in Tonto National Forest, that same creek site that tested positive in 2019 tested positive in 2020. And that creek site had flowing water, it was crystal clear, um, had lots of um, structure and sometimes vegetation. And so the sites were differing greatly in how they looked and their presence of salamanders. So field work can sometimes be physically challenging, especially at very muddy or deep sites where waders can get stuck or overflow. So here's a short funny clip of some moments in the field that were pretty challenging. Let it load a little bit. I'm so happy. So, once the challenges of field work are over, the samples are brought back to Northern Arizona U University where they're analyzed for the presence of ATV ronavirus. Swab results are then linked with field data and analyzed to detect trends in habitat conditions or spatial orientation. Variables of interest include area, water temperature, pH, turbidity, season, year, and the different number of amphibian species present at each site. So that could possibly link um, sites that have both frogs and salamanders. Through my analysis, I'm trying to answer the questions, where is the virus spatially in Arizona, especially for those Chiricahua leopard frogs? And what we found was that the virus is found across the state from the north, or the virus in general is found across the state from the north rim of the Grand Canyon to the southern part of the state. But in those Chiricahua leopard frogs, the virus has been found in two distinct locations. In that Tonto National Forest region, 
Um, that was kind of in the middle of Arizona. And then that southern site, which is down near the Galeros. I'm also trying to answer the question, how many individuals at a site are infected? So that links to the prevalence of ATV at a site. Um, and trying to see if detections are rare, are only one frog every once in a while testing positive, or is it possible to have a really high prevalence at sites? And I found that up to 100% or 30 individuals swabbed at a site can test positive for ATV ronavirus for both frogs and salamanders. Um, I've also found that ATV prevalence in salamanders is linked to late season sampling. Um, so that is sampling that occurs after um, July 1st. So they tend to have their epidemics happening later in the season. Um, I also found that smaller site areas tend to be linked to higher ATV prevalence. And this makes sense if you think about it because at a smaller site, amphibians might be bumping into each other more. And since uh, viruses can be transmitted just by touching each other, um, it might lead to higher transmission at smaller sites. Um, also, a greater number of species at a site was linked to higher ATV prevalence in salamanders. Um, and so this could be related to if the salamanders are able to uh, transmit the virus to other species, then there could be um, higher prevalence happening due to transmission between species. In the Chiricahua leopard frogs, I found that ATV prevalence is also linked to sites with smaller areas, um, but also sites that have increased turbidity. So that is kind of uh, how clear the water is. So sites that were more mucky and dirty and looked more like the site with a, kind of a chocolate milk water, those were also found to be linked with higher prevalence. And it's also interesting that through this sampling, we identified lots of uh, salamander species or lots of salamander individuals that had symptoms and mortality due to ATV ronavirus, but none was detected in Chiricahua leopard frogs. Even in ones that tested positive, there were no symptoms and no mortality. So more research is needed to understand if ATV actually poses a conservation threat to Chiricahua leopard frogs. Um, my research used swabs to detect ATV on these frogs, but really to um, confirm if this virus is infecting them or not. Um, we need to look at the tissue and organs of the frogs to see if the cells are actually infected with the virus. Um, but this is complicated because Chiricahua leopard frogs are a threatened species. And so it's difficult to justify killing them um, to look at their organs. So it will be important to continue surveys to monitor the frogs and make sure they're not developing symptoms or dying from ATV. Um, it'll also be good to further see where the virus is, that presence of ATV in the frogs in the state. And so we can kind of return to those sites and make sure that um, they're not developing symptoms or dying. So the mystery of ATV in the Chiricahua leopard frogs continues, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions in the meantime. Thank you so much, Kat. Uh, that was really interesting. I certainly learned a lot. <laughs> um, and it looks like we have a, one question that has come up here in the question and answer box. So let's take this one first. Um, is, let's see, is the possibility of virus something that would affect reintroduction of the leopard frogs? Let me just open that as well. Okay. 
Yeah, so this could definitely affect the reintroduction of the leopard frogs, especially um, that program at the Phoenix Zoo. If there is virus present at certain sites around the state that could be a, a threat to the frogs, um, they would not want to be releasing um, hundreds of their new tadpoles or metamorphs into sites that potentially have virus. And so it would definitely um, change where they would be releasing frogs from their captive breeding program. Um, and if they're gonna be taking frogs from sites too, they're gonna to need to definitely continue that quarantine and testing process before they introduce anything. Another question that came in is, are they currently monitoring other species of frogs for ATV? So um, my lab mate and I um, have swabbed some other frog species just coincidentally that happened to be at sites. Um, and we have potentially detected it on um, those Western chorus frogs that I mentioned earlier that live here in Flagstaff and those canyon tree frogs that I also showed a picture of. And so potentially there are other species that may be um, potentially being infected by ATV. Yeah, that was something I was curious about too, because I know you mentioned um, that the, the areas where they were found um, is more in Tonto and then more in the Southern part of the state. So one question I had was how, um, you know, how might they, this uh, prevalence of ATV be in the, in Northern species? Yeah, and so the, that northern leopard frog that I mentioned that lives up near Flagstaff, um, actually all the leopard frogs in Arizona are protected. Um, there's five native leopard frog species here in Arizona. They're all protected. And um, we have swabbed some of those northern leopard frogs, um, only I think about 20 of them. Um, and those came back negative, but it's definitely possible that if the Chiricahua leopard frogs and potentially chorus frogs and canyon tree frogs are testing positive, um, then those other leopard frog species too could potentially uh, be at risk as well. Mm -hmm. Another question that came in, how do you limit or eliminate the ATV virus and protect the salamanders? So we're actually less concerned about protecting the salamanders. Um, there is that endangered species of salamander that we do want to try to um, preserve. However, those barred tiger salamanders, that was what we were swabbing and collecting. They have a very healthy population all throughout North America. Um, and so we're less concerned about protecting those salamanders. Um, they've been dealing with this virus for since 1985, and it seems to be just kind of a cycle that some of them die and have big mortality events. Um, but what we're really concerned about is making sure that that virus isn't going to have the same effect in frogs, because those frog populations cannot um, have massive mortality events and recover like the salamanders can. Mm. And another question here, could other species such as a long range terrestrial reptile carry ATV? Great question. Um, so we also have some preliminary results that um, snakes and um, turtles can have ATV here in Arizona. Um, and these ones do tend to kind of move around a little bit more than the frogs might. And so again, um, there might be a larger range of species that can be infected than just the salamanders. That's, that's good to know. Um, and let's see if there's any other questions that you'd like to type in the Q&A box. Um, folks that are live with us right now. Otherwise, we're down to about 90 seconds here. Oh, look, it does look like we have one more that came in. How would you swab an Arizona black rattlesnake? <laughs> um, I would let Cody do that. <laughs> Cody works for Arizona Game and Fish and has helped me with a lot of my field work. And I would leave that to the professionals. 
So maybe that's why it was asked is teasing you a little bit. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Kat. And um, I do want to wrap up by mentioning one more time to our viewers to please answer uh, our survey questions this evening, perhaps um, after you log off. And we do have the survey in the chat box, but it's also easy to find on our website, scifest.org. And again, uh, for entering the survey, you do, um, you are entered to win a pair of Apple AirPods. So go ahead and um, make sure to fill out the survey. It really helps us with our data and um, planning for future years. And there's just a couple more days of the science festival, festival of science. So please um, check out the website as well for our passport. And we have an event calendar to make sure to get all of those great activities in your schedule for the remainder of the weekend. And finally, I wanna give one more shout out to all of our incredible sponsors that make this festival happen. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye.